Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Francis and Friends. We're so glad to join, have you join us this morning. Uh, this beautiful, it is Tuesday, am I right? Yes, sir. And uh, so we're so glad to have you. I just, uh, I wasn't able to be here yesterday, but I do want to comment on the Sunday service. We flat had a service yes, Sunday sir. morning. Mm -hmm. uh, Sunday night, I watched it again, and the music, oh, the music was absolutely fantastic. The presence of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord, uh, it, it came across so much different watching it than being in there. It was stronger yeah. watching it. Yeah. And uh, so that's what we try to do here at Sun Life Broadcasting Network. So I hope that you were able to uh, see that service. Uh, let, very quickly, let me introduce our panel today. Uh, so glad to have Gabe joining us today. Yeah. It's about time. I, it's, it's been a while since I've been it's on this It's been program. a while. And let, let me say this real quick. I mentioned it yesterday on the very last few minutes of Francis and Friends, but uh, the fall semester of Jimmy Swagger Bible College will begin in just about a month. And, uh, and so for those of you that are watching and uh, you've been wanting to be a part of JSBC, but for whatever reason you're not able to make it, we are going to be offering our online classes beginning in the fall. You can apply online at jsbc.edu and you can attend JSBC online. You'll be getting video lectures from our esteemed professors regarding the biblical courses. You'll also, of course, be having our English courses, science courses, math courses, and we want you to be developed into a well-rounded student that has a biblical world view. And so we encourage every one of you, if you're a teenager, if you're a young adult, and if you're an adult and you've never graduated, you've never gone to college, and you feel like this would be something great for you to do, we want, you, we want to encourage you, check us out, jsbc.edu, and apply now for JSBC online. I will second that. I know that you will be blessed. Brother Dave Smith is here. Amen. I'd like to invite people a week from Friday night to uh, Hayden, Alabama. That's the Birmingham, Alabama area. Uh, Dallas and Kim Smith are the pastors. Message of the Cross mm -hmm. Family Worship Center. Great people. Uh, yes, they are. Uh, 7 o'clock Friday night, 7 o'clock Saturday night, 10 a.m. Sunday morning. That's in Hayden, Alabama. For more information, call uh, 205 704 9196. Come out and be with them. I know that you will be blessed. Jim Nations is here. Yes, good morning, everyone. Great to be here. Carl Brown is here. Good morning, Donnie. Good morning, everyone. Got a couple of announcements. I will be coming to Orange, Texas on August the 2nd. Uh, this is a Sunday only, two services, 10 30 a.m. and 6 p.m. I will be with Mauriceville Assembly of God, located at 11477 Highway 12, and this is with, <clears throat> excuse me, this is with Pastor J.R. Armstrong and his wife, Sister Heather. For more information, you can contact 479-745-3403. And just a couple of weeks after that, I will be in Bowling Green, Ohio. Uh, this is April the 16th. Again, this is a Sunday only. And I want to make emphasis here because we come here about, have been coming to Bowling Green for about five years. And it always starts on a Friday, but this time it'll be a Sunday only. Two services, 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. This will be with Faith, Hope, Love Christian Church located at 404 North Dunbridge Road, and this is with Pastor Willie Mitchell, Willie Miller, I'm sorry, and his wife, Sister Eloise. For more information, you can contact 419-260-2294. So if you live in those areas, come out and be with Brother Brown. Just uh, before we get into the program today, I want to thank you once again for everyone that helped us on the share and uh, you can see the numbers on the screen right there. And I want to remind everyone that share does not officially end until the last day of the month. And we do that because uh, many of you that are watching, you're not able to give during that designated time, but you can 
at a later date uh, before the month is over. And so we are encouraging you, uh, if you're able to help us this week, go to the phones, go online, by mail, whatever the case, just make sure that you designate your gift uh, as for the share for the month of July. And we would greatly, greatly appreciate it more than you'll ever know. Well, today we have quite a program planned today. I mean, I think it's going to be one of the best that we have ever had. We are so honored today to have joining us uh, by what do they call Zoom. it? Zoom. 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 See, see, old guys, I don't know that technology. Zoom. And uh, he's joining us by Zoom, and it's Dinesh D'Souza. And uh, we are so glad to have him. Let me just read a bio, a little section of his bio, so you'll know. And I know many of you are familiar. If you're like me, uh, I'm an avid watcher of his YouTube videos. I mean, they are fascinating. But let me just read a quick bio. Dinesh D'Souza has, has had a prominent career as a writer, scholar, and public intellectual, and has also become an award-winning filmmaker. Born in India, D'Souza came to the U.S. as an exchange student at the age of 18 and graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Dartmouth College, called one of the top young policymakers in the country. D'Souza quickly became known as a major force in public policy through his books, speeches, and films. Dinesh D'Souza is a best-selling author and filmmaker. His films, 2016, Obama's America and America, Imagine a World Without Her, are respectively the number two and number six highest political documentaries of all time. D'Souza's feature-length film, Hillary's America, is widely credited with contributing to Hillary Clinton's defeat in 2016 and quickly joined his first two films in the top ten political documentaries of all time. D'Souza's latest film, Death of a Nation, builds on this success and takes on progressive big lies, finally proving once and for all that the real party of fascism and racism is now and has always been the Democratic Party. In D'Souza's newest path-breaking book, United States of Socialism, he reveals how the left uses the Venezuelan formula for socialism, decisively refutes the new face of socialism, and chillingly documents the full range of the left's gangster tendencies and provocatively, provocatively exposes the tactics of the socialist left. Born in Mumbai, India, Dinesh has truly lived the American dream. He he moved to the United States to attend school on a Rotary scholarship following graduation from Dartmouth College. He went on to work in the Reagan White House as a policy analyst. D'Souza has served as the John M. Olin Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and the Robert and Karen Rishwam Fellow at uh, University. He has written over 15 nationally renowned books, many of them number one New York Times bestsellers. He has been invited to speak to groups all over the country on politics, philosophy, and Christianity. And this is the part I love. His razor-sharp wit and entertaining style have allowed him to participate in highly publicized debates about politics and Christianity with some of the most famous atheists and leftists of our time, including Christopher Hitchens, Bill Ayers, and others. Dinesh, we want to welcome you today to Francis and Friends and the 140 countries that this is going out live. And I just want to say before I introduce the panel to you that I am one of your biggest fans. I spend hours on YouTube watching you debate, listening to your speeches. And when I found out you were going to be with us, I said, hallelujah. And so we're glad to have you joining us today. Thank you very much. I'm uh, looking forward to it. Uh, this is my first time on the program, and I'm thrilled to be sharing my ideas with your panel and your audience. Well, we are 
anxious, anxious to hear everything that you have. My son Gabriel uh, is here, is one of our panel members, Brother Dave Smith, uh, Brother Jim Nations, Brother Carl Brown, myself, Donnie Swaggart, and the host of the program and the boss of the program, my mother. And, uh, and so, Dinesh, we're going to have a great, great time this afternoon. So I'm turning you, this morning, so I'm turning you over to the boss. And that's my mother, <laughs> Frances Swaggart. Yes, welcome to the program today, Dinesh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have in my hands your latest book, The United States of a Socialism. And uh, I have hardly been able to put it down ever since I've had it. And uh, just excellent. And I have had the privilege of, uh, I saw two of your movies, which were absolutely fantastic. And um, of course, we keep up with you uh, according to what's happening on the news, as Donnie said. Uh, but we have a panel here. They will be helping ask questions. And so I'm interested. I'd like to start out this interview today concerning your book, The United States of Socialism. And I was, I'm interested in what you have to say because you were speaking of the new socialism that ex is espoused by a number of uh, our leading uh, leaders in the Democratic Party and uh, that are actually running for president, so forth and so on. The, the socialism that you were speaking of is not exactly the socialism that we have been speaking of in the past. So as we begin this interview, I'd like for you to kind of state and explain what you mean by the United States of Socialism. The title um, United States of Socialism refers to the uh, possibility that socialism will become the governing uh, model or the governing philosophy of the United States for the first time uh, in this country's history. Now, socialism has been tried in many parts of the world. Um, if we go back to the 20th century, the last century, almost half of the planet was governed by socialism. I, I grew right. up, for example, in India. India was a socialist country. I remember my uh, family had a ration card which uh, specified how much rice and cooking oil and sugar we could buy. So this is part of what socialism does. It's state control of industry, of the means of production. And of course, we had socialism in Russia and China. It all seemed to collapse at the end of the 20th century. And I think many people at that time would have been very surprised had anyone told them that so socialism would make a comeback, <coughs> excuse me, in the early 21st century. But here we are. Socialism is back. Many young people espouse it. It is moving to okay. the Okay, can I interrupt just a second there? Sure. And you're right about that, but it has failed in every society. It has not succeeded anywhere. It's been a failed system. So why are we even at the place that we're at in this country today? I think the first reason is that many uh, young people don't know the history that you're referring to. Right. Uh, they have gone to schools and colleges where they have been taught that capitalism uh, is an evil and immoral system, that it contributes to inequality and social injustice. And so what's the alternative to free market capitalism? Well, it has to be some form of, of socialism. And so young people think They've been taught by their professors, they've been propagandized to believe that there is a kind of new socialism that we can invent now that will avoid uh, the mistakes of the past and will work while previous attempts have failed. Um, okay, what, but what is this socialism? Um, it's not socialism, as I said earlier in the program. 
um, that we today are familiar with. That was what was so interesting as I began reading this book, as you were defining the socialists of today, how they really view socialism versus what we have been. I've always made the statement that the so, that socialism is the first step or maybe the last step to communism. I, 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 it's hard in my mind to separate the two because that's what I see. But is that exactly true today? Well, the way to understand this, I think, is that communism is a political system and socialism, at least the way it was devised by Marx, is an economic system. So if you think, for example, of China, uh, China, for most of the 20th century, under Mao, for example, used to be communist in its political system which is totalitarian, ruled from the center, but it also was socialist in its economic system. And then starting in the 1980s under Deng Xiaoping, uh, China began to move away from socialism, but it preserved its communist political system. So China today is a very strange uh, hybrid of communism as a political system, but a certain kind of state-run capitalism as its economic system. Now, in America, the left says that all these earlier forms of socialism were uh, authoritarian socialism, tyrannical socialism. We think of Lenin or Stalin or Mao Zedong. And what they say, these young people today in America, people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others, they say, we want democratic socialism. Mm -hmm. And democratic socialism is sort of uh, government by the people of the American economy. So they think that this democratic socialism has a moral legitimacy and credibility uh, that authoritarian socialism doesn't have. Uh, okay, uh, does any of the panel yeah, have that? I, I do. Uh, Dinesh, uh, I wanted to ask you this question regarding democratic socialism. I know that is something that uh, a lot of young people, younger than me, I'm 40, but there are, of course, those that are in their 20s and 30s that believe democratic socialism is the way to go. So how would you present to these young people the dangers of democratic socialism and how that there's really no such thing as democratic socialism, that it really leads to socialism in general? Well, I would begin by uh, looking at the rhetoric of the democratic socialists. They will say things like, we've got to take health care away from the profit-making insurance companies uh, and give it to the people. Mm -hmm. We want the people, uh, this is the meaning of democracy, the people, will govern the healthcare system. But I say to myself, wait a minute, um, all these government-run institutions, which are supposed to be run by the people, are not in fact run by the people at all. So right. for example, what say do you or I right now have over the U.S. post office? No. We don't have any say. What say do you or I have over the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles? None. Um, what say do the British people have over the British National Health Service? None. Um, so this idea that the people are going to be running these institutions is a myth. The truth of it is they're going to be run by the politicians. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of why the politicians, in the name of the people, are actually drawing power unto themselves. I think a second point I'd like to stress is that just because something is authorized by the people, which is to say by a majority, doesn't actually make it right. right. So when I was a kid, I would go to school and for recess, I would carry in my pocket a, a bunch of marbles to play marbles with my friends. Now imagine if one guy attacks me, jumps on me and steals my marbles. That would be sort of like authoritarian socialism. A dictator is confiscating my property, my marbles, and taking them for himself. Now, here's a second example. I go to the same school and I'm surrounded by 10 guys uh, and they take a vote and eight of them decide, let's all take Dinesh's marbles. And so they subdue me and they take my marbles. So what's the difference between these two cases? Well, one is authoritarian, one guy did it. The second is democratic. They took a vote and a majority of guys did it. But notice that in both cases, I'm being robbed. In both cases, the same transaction is occurring and it's no more moral because it's done by a majority than if it was done by one person. Right. Having, having lived in the countries, you're very familiar with it. America is not 
we think we have an understanding of it, but I'm not sure that the average citizen does. Um, and you're watching this start in the United States of America, the, and now this is your home state. You're a citizen of this great country. Um, share with the people what you personally have experienced. Well, I grew up um, in India at a time when India had democratic socialism. So this idea that in the past it was only authoritarian socialism and this time we're going to get it right with democratic socialism. No, uh, India had democratic socialism and it was a miserable failure. The Indian leaders in the 1940s adopted this socialist model. Many of them had studied in England and they had been influenced by a group of so-called Fabian socialists. So they came back with these big five-year plans. Now remember at this time, India was considered the begging bowl of the world. Mm -hmm. Socialism kept the country miserably poor for 50 years. Uh, India is doing better now. Why? Because it's moving away. It has been moving away for 30 years now from the socialist model. And so uh, socialism to me represents endemic corruption. Um, our family was on a seven year waiting list to get a phone. Think about it. The government yeah. made the phones, they controlled the phone company and they were so inept, so incompetent that they couldn't deliver phones to people who wanted them. You had to wait for seven years. So this is what socialism means. It means empty shelves. It means shortages. It means government incompetence, putting the politicians in charge of things that politicians don't know how to do. And ultimately, it also means tyranny, uh, government control over your ordinary life. And I think this is what makes socialism um, most terrifying, is that it ultimately is an extinction, a, a kind of snuffing out of civil liberties and individual freedom. Um Okay, America has never experienced anything like that. We've always had freedoms. We've had our freedoms. However, uh, I, I wake up every morning realizing how much in danger we are and how close we really are to losing all of our freedoms here in the United States of America. How close are we in America to being a complete to be in socialist? Well, interestingly, under the coronavirus lockdown, we have gotten a kind of nasty preview on a temporary yeah. basis mm -hmm. of, of what socialism might look like on a permanent basis. So suddenly Americans who previously were never familiar with these things uh, walk into the grocery store and you can't buy toilet paper or is there, there's a limit on milk. Um, my wife is from Venezuela, and she'd been telling me for a while about the empty shelves in Venezuela, the, the way that socialism has ruined that society. But it's very difficult to explain this to Americans because they have previously had no experience of this kind of thing. But now, I, I, under the coronavirus lockdown, not only do we see the economic effects of government control, but also the attack on civil liberties, the restrictions on churches, the restrictions on privacy, attempt to sort of have surveillance of our ordinary movements. So all these restrictions on personal liberty are also a hallmark of socialism. Uh, the left, I think, has been very clever at using the politics of fear, um, uh, fear that things will be horrible unless you agree to these socialist solutions. And they've been doing this for a while now. It actually goes all the way back to the Depression when FDR was able to use the, the real fear of the Depression to do things that he couldn't otherwise have done. Uh, and so since the 70s, I, since I came to America, I've been always hearing some sort of panic. The world is running out of food, uh, nuclear winter, uh, the ozone layer is dissipating, uh, climate change is going to bring about the apocalypse, and now coronavirus. So the basic idea here is to scare us into thinking that the world is going to end if we don't agree to these 17 proposals that have to be enacted immediately. So things we would never do if we gave it calm and rational deliberation, we are pushed to do in a sort of somewhat fabricated panic. Yes. Okay, we've got to take a quick break, and we're going to be right back after the break. Email your questions and comments about today's program to onair at jsm.org. Join Francis and Friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Francis Swigert. 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. And I was just looking through your book uh, just a minute while we were on the br uh, break. You make a statement in here, I believe it's on page 35, right at the beginning of the book. And uh, you said that you grew up in a country that didn't even have a lot of the basic uh, things that are needed. And when you came to America, and you were, came here as an exchange student. Just describe coming from where you lived to America. What was America like? I was 17 years old, and um, I came from a country where, you know, Americans would tell their children, listen, Johnny, you better eat your food because there are millions of starving people in India. Mm -hmm. Now, right. my family wasn't one of those starving people. We were part of the small Indian middle class. But while we had, we didn't lack for any necessities, we certainly had no luxuries. When I came to America, I was just struck by two things. One is the abundance of ordinary life. In other words, uh, rich guys live well anywhere in the world. I was struck by what kind of abundance America provides to the ordinary guy, the, the common man, if you will. The common man lives in a nice house with central air and two cars and a nice backyard. Uh, so that this kind of um, uh, pros prosperous life that was available to the ordinary citizen, this struck me as uh, very uh, important. The other thing was I realized coming to America that this was a country where I could write the script of my own life. Uh, I could be, uh, to a degree, almost unimaginable in other parts of the world. I could be the author of my own destiny. It's almost like being in the driver's seat of your own future. So this, to me, represented the magnetic appeal of America uh, throughout the world. People are always trying to come here. Uh, and I, it's so interesting because in America, when you go to college, your professors will tell you, oh, America's horrible. It's a racist country. It's this and it's that. And I think to myself, well, if America is so bad, why are people trying to break down the doors and swim the creek and jump the fences? The only reason we have a big debate about illegal immigration is because so many people, if America just opened the borders, half the world would be here. Mm -hmm. So the world knows something that evidently our professors don't know, mm -hmm. which is that it's actually a very good life in America. Amen. Have, have you found America to be racist? Not in the slightest. In fact, I'm sort of struck by the, uh, look, I'm not, I'm a, I've, I've studied this now for 20 years and I'm, not foolish enough to believe that America is racism free. One can obviously search a big country and find examples of it. But one remarkable thing in the last several years, and we've seen several notable examples in the last year alone, people are actually faking racial incidents. They're making them up. Mm -hmm. A guy mm -hmm. will go and put racist notes on his own car and then call the police and say, I'm a victim of a hate crime. Now, think about it. Why would someone do that? The only reason people do that uh, is because they the, the racism that they want to point to in society, they can't find. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And so I found living in America, and I've been actually in the conservative precincts of American life, a great deal of acceptance and tolerance. People judge you by and large, as Martin Luther King said, as an individual based upon your merits and based upon your character. Um, and so I'm struck by the enormous talk about racism and then the um, fact that in experience, racism is not all that common. Yeah. All right. Carl Brown has a question for you. Dinesh, this is Carl Brown, of course. Like the swagger just introduced me. I, I, I'd like to comment that I do really appreciate your commentary on Fox News. <laughs> I see quite a bit. And I want to make a comment on something you just said to me with a, de a very powerful statement that since you've been in America, you feel like you're in the driving seat of your own destiny. That is a very powerful statement, and that statement applies to every American. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely awesome. My question is this. In light of the failure of socialism in other countries around the world, are you aware of any strategic efforts other than the politics of fear that's, in, that's uh, used by those that are fostering the socialism in our country. Is there a strategic effort in the dumbing down of Americans to believe that something such as 
socialism would be better than cap capitalism? Are you aware of any such tactics or agenda used by this? There is a um, systematic uh, campaign <clears throat> in the uh, colleges and universities. Uh, I speak more of the colleges and universities because I went to high school in India. I went to the 12th grade here, but I'm much more familiar with the university experience. There's an effort to demonize the free market system uh, and to demonize uh, American history and to demon demonize many of the icons of American history. These days, when we see vandals defacing monuments, uh, in some ways, they are doing nothing more than acting out uh, what their professors have taught them. So there is a strategic campaign uh, dominated by professors on the left in academia uh, to propagandize against capitalism and for socialism. I think another factor is that under the coronavirus lockdown, uh, many people have been essentially at home. You can say sitting on the couch, just like me right now, except they've been doing it for months. Uh, and, and so the left is able to go to these guys and say, hey, listen, pal, um, do you really want to go back to work? You're going to have to start shaving again, and you're going to have to start getting dressed and punching in a time clock and listening to your boss. Uh, how about if we gave you $2,000 a month to just sit right where you are, keep eating potato chips and watching TV. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be a lifelong slug. So you can see right here that there is a certain part of human nature uh, that wants to sit on the couch, uh, that wouldn't mind collecting a, an entitlement check every month. And so the socialists very cunningly appeal to this kind of low, slothful, lazy part of human nature and try ultimately to use it as a mechanism to gain power for themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, you, wow. you mentioned that you were you went to high school in India and then you came to America for higher studies, but I believe that there has been a strategic move in our nation that even begins long before you reach college uh, and even high school. It's starting in very early in life now, this dumbing down of America's uh, disbelief in capitalism and affecting our young people. And I think that the greater part of the American population that buys into socialism is that younger generation that's coming about today. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, let's get back to the uh, socialism and the ones that are promoting it today, because we see it in the news, we, we see it everywhere. A communist, well, let me change that. A uh, socialist nation versus a free nation, which you have experience in both. You, you, uh, you came from India to America, which is free and allowed your ideas to develop and you to become the man that you are today. Our young people today don't understand socialism. And I'm afraid that, as you've just been saying concerning the colleges and all of our edu educational system, even in their grade schools, so forth and so on, they are taught socialism from the time they enter that school, whether it's just kindergarten or what, until they graduate. So consequently, we've got what we've got today. We've got a nation full of young people that does not understand capitalism. And they see it as an evil uh, thing that they've got to help get rid of for the benefit of mankind. Um, what do you recommend? Because we've got them. I mean, the media, news media promotes them. Our um, uh, uh, immigration system, they use it every way they can. They want to flood this nation with immigrants so that America loses its identity. How do we get that message out? The um, young people today take for granted the um, success of technological capitalism. Uh, it's all around them. If you were to say to someone, a young person, hey, listen, you don't like capitalism, so let's get rid of your iPhone mm -hmm. and uh, let's stop using uh, Uber and let's take away your, uh, let's not uh, go to an Airbnb uh, and let's stop using the GPS system that technological capitalism has developed and marketed. Let's take away, in other words, all these technological gadgets 
that were not created by the government. Um, the government is enormously inefficient. I mean, think of the post office. They've been operating now for well over a century. They never even thought of delivering overnight mail, even though the airplane has been invented for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it took private companies to, to start thinking of overnight mail, and then the post office goes, oh, well, you know what, gee, we can do that too. So this gives you an idea of how unimaginative, uncreative, uninnovative these government institutions are compared to the private sector. So the, the irony is that we live in the midst of a successful capitalist society. I think what young people think of when they think of socialism is they think of getting things for free. Mm -hmm. uh, so just as their parents give them stuff for free and spoil them to a degree, these young people think that when we become adults, maybe it can be the same thing. I can get free college, I can get free health care. As I get older, I can look forward to free retirement. So socialism today is marketed very differently than it used to be. It used to be marketed as the revolt of the working class, a union guy trying to get better wages for himself. But now it's marketed as basically a philosophy of doing nothing and getting everything in return as a kind of entitlement. Uh, and this is ultimately what the left and the Democrats kind of sell, is they sell the idea of robbing Peter to pay Paul mm -hmm. and thereby counting on Paul's political support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, you speak at a lot of college universities, and, um, and we know how our colleges are here in America today. What kind of difficulty, difficulty if any, do you have um, speaking at the colleges, do they try to shut you down, as we've seen mm -hmm. happen so many times? What is your experience with our colleges, our universities all over America? Well, unfortunately, they've become um, very close-minded. It seems uh, ironic to say, because the model of a university is ultimately Socrates on the street of Athens, uh, having a free and open debate or dialogue um, the engagement of ideas. Well, relatively little of that is happening in our universities today. Our universities have become uh, propaganda factories, and young people are often subjected to only one point of view. So on occasions when I speak on the campus, uh, I often notice a kind of look of uh, wide-eyed amazement on the part of young people. Why? Because many of the things that I'm telling them, they've never heard before. They haven't seen it in their textbooks. Their professors haven't uh, told them. And so they look at me with disbelief. Uh, and I say, hey, listen, if you doubt what I have to say, just take one minute, uh, Google it mm -hmm. on your phone, and you'll see that what I'm telling you is indisputable. It's factually correct. There it is in the historical record. Uh, and yet you don't know it because you haven't been told it because your professors have been selling you a bill of goods. You, you know, the president... I just uh, read something a couple of days ago. The president on Twitter, you know, he's famous for using Twitter, stated that he would like to defund a lot of these colleges mm -hmm. that are teaching propaganda and socialism. And what, what, do you, what are your feelings about that? I think that's actually uh, very important. It's almost a uh, kind of conservative counterpart to defund the police. We obviously need police. But the, and we need universities. No one says no. The problem with the universities, however, is that they have taken this taxpayer support and made themselves into organs of propaganda. That's not what they were set up to be. Right. And so my idea for defunding the universities is using the leverage of federal support uh, to pressure these universities into doing nothing more than returning to their own roots which is opening up dialogue, ensuring a true diversity of ideas, uh, and allowing young people to get something that they're not getting now, namely an education. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I saw uh, also that Harvard University, they had something that less yeah. than 1% of their faculty was actually had conservative leanings, less than 1%. So, I mean, right there in the hiring process, you're not getting what you should as a student. Uh, which is an open debate and ideas from all different points of view. You're getting one ideology and it's destroying this country. Right. You, you have... Uh, go ahead and respond to Gabriel. Well, I think something very comical is that the word that universities use more than any other, if you were to pick one word that is, 
kind of echoing across the academia, it's the word diversity. Mm -hmm. So they keep saying diversity, diversity, diversity. But here's what they mean. What they mean is diversity kind of within the socialist camp. And right. so if you look at a typical department of sociology or history uh, in a university, you'll find uh, a, an eco-socialist and a feminist socialist and an Afro-socialist and an Islamo-socialist and a gay socialist and a transgender socialist. And so they go, oh, wow, this is amazing. Look at all this diversity. But the truth of it is they're all unified around the socialist ideology. And if a student stands up and says something like, I don't like socialism and here's why, they all gang up on this right, kid right. Uh, and begin to sort of subdue him or her because they are ultimately not about diversity but about ideological uniformity. Right, right. yeah. I understand you have a new, new movie that's coming out, I believe it's August the 7th, and um, it is so extremely important. I feel that people see that movie. Um, and I, as I say, I have been privileged to watch two of your movies, and it's quite amazing. Um, how did you get involved in and get on the right side of everything? And I'm going to ask two questions in one. I'd like to discuss the president of the United States, D Donald Trump. And uh, you've seen the tremendous opposition that that man has had to people downright lying on him, to doing everything they can to get him in, out of office, the likes of what we in America have never seen before. And uh, so give us a little first of all history about your movie, your, that you, the, your new movie that's coming out. The film uh, is called Trump Card. And mm -hmm. the reason I titled it Trump Card is because Trump is the uh, dominant figure, not only in the American, but to some degree in the worldwide political debate. Uh, you could almost define the uh, dividing line in the world between the people who like Trump and kind of warm to Trump, and on the other side, the people who hate Trump and think mm -hmm. that Trump represents everything that is bad about the United States and bad about leadership. Um, now, uh, Trump is not a typical political figure. He came uh, out of the business world. In some ways, he, is, he was, in his previous life, the quintessential capitalist. Right. He was a builder. Uh, if you think about it, capitalism is about building things, and socialism is about pulling them down. Mm. That's why the socialists today are all about pulling down monuments. Mm. They pull down the monument of Columbus. They pull down the monument of the Christian missionary who started the missions in California. They pull down the monument of Abraham Lincoln. Now think about it. I mean, Columbus, here's a guy, if Columbus did not exist, we wouldn't have America as we know it. We wouldn't actually have an industrial civilization here of the kind that we have now. All these people's existence, existence is dependent on Columbus. Columbus was a pioneer, an explorer, and ultimately a foundation builder. And that's what these people hate about him because they can't build anything themselves. Right. Um, and so, but they can pull things down, which is easier to do. Um, so the film Trump Card, it will be in theaters later this summer uh, and hopefully abroad uh, as well, available online through to Apple iTunes and all the various ways you can get movies. Um, and uh, typically I like to do the book and the movie as a kind of a one-two punch. Uh, the book is an intellectual argument. It's an exploration of ideas. It has all the references. But then the movie is a more of an emotional narrative. It tells a story uh, and it takes you on a journey uh, and I like my movies to be, well, they're a little frightening because of what they portray, but they're also in the end, I think, moving and inspiring. Dinesh, let me ask you this question. You know, we are a Christian ministry. Uh, we're all, we have a local church. My dad is the longest running television preacher in television history. He's been on television for well over 50 years every single Sunday. So we approach things from a spiritual point of view. And of course, in doing that, people get upset with us because they say you shouldn't mix politics. But we say that to the Christian, everything is spiritual. That's right. Bad government hurts the church. That's right. If the government is bad, the church will always be hindered in its mission and getting forth its message. What we're seeing, and the one of the, one of the things that we're fighting in Christianity, 
is number one, Christians falling for socialism. And mm -hmm. secondly, Christians with the attitude that we shouldn't get involved and we shouldn't vote. So what would you comment on those two things? The, um, the Christian appeal uh, of socialism, uh, I think, is based upon the notion that the early Christians were somehow socialists. Uh, we read in the book of Acts that mm -hmm. the early Christians lived in communities where mm -hmm. they had all things in common. And on the first glance, this looks like, wow, here's socialism. And so the Christian left will point to this and say, this is kind of what we have in mind. But really, it's not. Why? Because the early Christian communities were voluntary. Right. There were groups of people who had their spiritual beliefs in common. Uh, and they, so they were not proposing a recipe for the full society. They weren't saying, hey, Roman Empire, you've got to do the same as we're doing. Not at all. This was a kind of voluntary uh, community that was, and remember, held together also by the forces of persecution. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this could not be further removed from the kind of socialism that represents government control of industry, government control of banks, government control of healthcare, the government trying to govern the ordinary life of the citizens. The model for that was more the Roman Empire itself and the way that it was trying to regulate and control and dominate the lives of the Christians. So if you're looking for the true socialists, they weren't the Christians, they were the Romans. Yeah, right. well, you know, first, you know, because I answer that is, yes, that happened once. Yeah. In the book of Acts. Right. And it only went, lasted for a short time, and you don't read about any other place where Christianity was established that they did this. This, this, was, this came about because of persecution and Christians losing jobs, losing where they live. And so for a short period of time in Jerusalem, the Christians came together and said, if we don't take care of ourselves, nobody will. But eventually that passed away and they were able to take care of themselves. But what about the attitude of Christians, I don't want to vote, I don't want to get involved in this? I think that that is, um, that is a, um, a serious mistake uh, because this is not even about the boundaries of church and state. Uh, our whole political system, our whole economic system, the whole foundations of America, and in fact of the West, are based upon, you may say, root Christian concepts. Mm -hmm. So, for example, people will talk even today about things like human dignity. Well, let's pause for a minute. Where do we get human dignity? Uh, where do we get this idea that every human life is precious? Where do we get the idea that we have these inviolable rights? Well, if we turn to Thomas Jefferson, it's very obvious that these rights come from God. They're from our creator. Where else would they come from? What other being exists to kind of confer these rights and make human beings special? Uh, there's no other source that I can see for it, nor was Jefferson able to think of one. So the fact of the matter is that much of the stuff that we're debating isn't about things like the church and the state. It's about things like, is there a moral order in the universe, which is external to us and makes claims on us? Uh, the left, um, one of the deep insights of a Russian uh, um, dissident, Igor Shafarevich, was that the socialists always talk about economics, uh, but they always attack institutions that go beyond economics. They aren't just going after property, they're also going after the traditional family. They're going after the church. They're going after the idea of morality itself. That's why they're defacing Jesus statues and statues of the Virgin Mary. It's not an accident, for example, when there was the huge demonstration and riot in Washington, D.C., they burned St. John's Church. Why? They could have gone and burned Planned Parenthood, but they didn't do that. Right. Uh, it's not accidental that they choose the institutions that represent not only theology, but also morality for attack. Right. Uh, let me ask this question. It says, and this is from one of our listeners, it said, the Marxist Islamics seems like they own the airwaves, seemingly, and higher education. How do we get the truth out to change young minds? Or is it too late now? Uh, what are your thoughts? 
going into this into the election say, season, can the left steal, steal S T E A L this election? Well, that's a, that's there a, are several themes here that I can, I'll just briefly touch upon. The first one is I think that um, uh, Christians and conservatives have been very um, derelict in allowing the left to become so dominant mm -hmm. uh, in what I would call the megaphones of our culture. And by this, I mean academia, I mean the media, and I mean Hollywood. We have literally allowed the left to take control of those institutions, and we're seeing the effect of it now. This is a long-term problem that goes way beyond Trump because it affects not just this election, but every election. So turning that around is not going to be easy. Now, we do have one channel uh, that reaches people that is independent of Hollywood and independent of academia and independent of the media, and that is the church. And so what I see is the great, this is not a reference to your church, but it's a reference in general to pastors who are very reluctant uh, to transmit what they see as political messages. And so they take the one channel that is a way to reach people and they shut it down. Mm -hmm. uh, they confine ultimately their communications. They, they make politics, if you will, out of bounds. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we are literally letting the country uh, slip away by letting the other side aggressively use the megaphones that it possesses yeah. while not using the megaphones that we have. Yeah. All right, we got to go to a quick break, and we're going to be right back after the break. And I will be taking your calls, um, and, but we want to stay on the topic and the subject that we're discussing today. And uh, this is a toll-free number, and we invite all of you to call, whether you agree or you disagree with our guests today. Um, we still would like to hear from you. And uh, that number is 800 342-8430. We'll be right back. Truth. Sometimes it's hard to find. That's why there's Francis and Friends. Previous Francis and Friends programs are available online at sunlifetv.com. Okay, we're back, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to read an email that uh, just came in, and it says, uh, Dinesh, um, when did you know that the Obama administration was actively coming after you, and what did you do when you first learned about it? So the uh, Obama administration um, came after me and charged me um, with a criminal offense uh, exceeding the campaign finance laws uh, by giving money to a college friend of mine who was running for the Senate in New York. Right. Um, now, I made a movie in 2012 called Obama's America, and the movie came out in the summer uh, of 2012. And right at, as, as soon as the movie appeared in theaters, I noticed that I was being attacked daily on a website called BarackObama.com. So it was very obvious to me that uh, Obama was attacking me on his own website. So it was very obvious that he was very angry and hostile to the movie that I had made, which went into his own life. I had an interview with his own brother. And so it was a kind of a movie that exposed a lot of the hypocrisy of Obama. So literally weeks later, the FBI comes banging on my door. And so it, you know, it doesn't take a great leap of genius to see the uh, connection uh, between Obama's hostility to my film uh, and then an attempt to go after me on and something that is an offense, but is normally considered a kind of technical offense. You get a warning and maybe a small fine. Uh, no person in American history has ever been um, heavily prosecuted as I was for doing what I did. Right, right. We know all of that. We watched it play out on television, and we realized what was happening to you and our prayers were with you during this time. But, uh, Donna, you wanted to say something? Yeah, you know, Dinesh, I've watched a lot of your videos on YouTube, and I, first of all, I just want to compliment you on your demeanor on these campuses. But how, how can you... You know, I love the Lord, but boy, my patience only goes so far. How, how do you endure all of the hatred? I mean, I've heard them cuss you, 
call you the most vile, vilest names. I mean, you, you, I think they would treat Charles Manson better than you. Uh, and so how do you handle that? Well, the thing you have to remember is that um, these are young people who have been uh, propagandized. Mm -hmm. And so they don't know a lot uh, but they have a lot of that idealism and I would even say self-righteousness of youth. Mm -hmm. So ignorance and self-righteousness, it's a very bad combination. Uh, and it produces a fairly comic spectacle uh, where these young people start screaming at me for saying things that are manifestly true uh, that they can't actually dispute. And so their screaming is a kind of new form of argument. Right. It's an all if you don't know what to say, it's kind of like when you're a kid, you can't answer your parents, so you run screaming out of the room. Uh, this is the kind of adolescent uh, equivalent of that. So what should I do? I mean, I don't want to get angry at these young people who are sort of young enough to be my sons or daughters. Uh, I try to understand where they're coming from, and I try to test them against their own principles. So somebody will say something like, you know, I am a beneficiary of white privilege. <laughs> yeah. so I'll say, I'll say, okay, well, uh, I understand that. Now, listen, you're a beneficiary of white privilege. I'm not accusing you of that. You're telling me that. Right. Uh, and so what you're really telling me is that your position in this university is undeserved. You really shouldn't be here. Uh, there should be a deserving minority in your place. So why don't you go tomorrow uh, to the registrar's office and withdraw from the university uh, and tell them to give your spot uh, to a deserving minority? Isn't that the moral consequence of what you're saying? Not what I'm saying, but what you're saying. And then they get extremely agitated. Well, that's not the issue. You know, I, I realize, Dinesh, you want to talk about general hypocrisy. And I go, no, no, I'm not talking about general hypocrisy. I'm only talking about your hypocrisy. Right. I'm just trying to make you live up to your convictions as you have stated them. So this is kind of my technique to use the old Socratic device of holding people to account for their own convictions. Yeah. You know, watching both Dinesh and Charlie Kirk, yeah. Yeah. Charlie Kirk. both of those individuals uh, are, are famous for going into these liberal universities, which I applaud. I mean, I, I look at both what, I follow both of you on social media, and uh, um, I see some of the videos that Charlie Kirk from Turning Point USA begins to post and Candace Owens and things of that nature. And uh, I'm, I'm amazed at just the outright, uh, and I hate to use this word, but stupidity hmm. that is being brought into our college systems. And yet the amount of knowledge that Dinesh, Charlie Kirk, and others, they just, they go through common sense. Hmm. And it's amazing to see. So I, I just wanted to say how much I applaud both you and Charlie on doing that. It's an amazing thing to see. And it's, it's, it's blessing me. And I enjoy it uh, whenever you're able to uh, to speak out and speak against a lot of these issues. Let me give you a question. For, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm going to let you answer. Uh, I was going to say that the, the left, um, both in media and in academia, is very good about selling people on a narrative. Right. Yeah. Now, a narrative yeah. is not facts. A narrative is an interpretation of facts that tells a story. And their narrative is that Western civilization, going all the way back, let's say, to Columbus, has been an uninterrupted series of oppressions and crimes that have been visited on non-white and non-Western people. Now, you know, this is something, I mean, I'm non-white, I'm non-Western in my roots, so this is something I can speak with some authority about. Uh, and so, for example, the left would point to, well, the British, of course, came to India and they ruled India for 200 years. And then I say, well, that's true. But let's first of all remember that before the British, India was invaded by the Afghans uh, and the Muslims uh, and the Arabs, uh, Alexander the Great mm -hmm. earlier than that. So India had been subject to a series of invasions of which the British was only the latest installment. And second of all, the British left India with many things that the Indians still treasure. We still have democracy. We still have parliamentary systems of justice. We still have Western courts. Think about it. The British left in 1947 and the Indians could easily have said, thank God the British have gone. Let's stop speaking English. Let's stop wearing these, these horrible Western suits. 
let's dismantle the European systems of government. But the Indians did no such thing. They continued many of the things that were imported originally by the British. So this whole picture of sort of Western oppression and non-white subjugation is a narrative that needs to be challenged yes. uh, to at least produce some modicum of balance. Yes. And that's what I try to do on the campus. And it meets with a lot of resistance. People can't believe that here is a guy from India, a brown skinned guy who's <laughs> disputing this yeah. propaganda. And I say, listen, this isn't just me. Talk to any Indian on the street and, and, and they will agree that the influence of the West and of America in the world has on the balance been positive. All right. Let me ask you a question. Um, it said that um, I, I want to say that in addition to uh, the Democratic Socialists, um, they're racing at hyper speed to promote socialism in America. Um, and uh, um, it says American citizens need to know that it's not just about power but it's greed as well when we so now we're getting into the wealth redistribution uh and said all these millionaire and billionaire democrats pushing redistribution of wealth and every single solitary one of them continues to hold on to their wealth so we're saying uh, we're going to take your wealth but we're going to keep our wealth. So let's talk about redistribution of money. Isn't this what this is all about? Well, for the socialists, it's not simply a matter of we want to keep our wealth, but that they use politics as a way to make money, to get rich. Right. And uh, you can see this in really all the important uh, families on the Democratic side. They have made a lot of money. Now, look, no one disputes that you can make money by starting a business, coming up with something new, a new idea, uh, but they don't do any of that. So, for example, the Clintons. The Clintons were flat broke, uh, and they went from zero to $200 million. Mm. Uh, and they did this on a government salary. Right. Uh, Al Gore has accumulated enormous wealth. The Biden family has accumulated enormous wealth. Now, the trick here is to figure out how to leverage your public position as a right. politician yes. uh, to access cash. And the remarkable thing with Biden, for example, is if you look at Biden's own net worth over the years, it hasn't gone up all that much. Why? Because if Biden does any transactions, he has to disclose them. This is a political requirement. So what Biden does is whenever he goes to a foreign country, he takes along one of his two brothers, uh, James Biden or his son, Hunter Biden, and they cut deals on the side with the foreign government, but in Biden's name, right. using the Biden family name. So here's Biden. He's got over $100 million, multiple palatial residences and so on. And again, has he invented the iPhone? No. Did he start Amazon? No. He hasn't created any kind of a productive business. He has merely leveraged his public connections. And by the way, this goes on. This is not unique to America. It's, it's a racket that goes on throughout the third world, for example. All kinds of Indian politicians are collecting money on the side. So most of your listeners all over the world would be, and viewers, would be very familiar with this racket. But some people think it doesn't occur in America, but alas, it does. Yeah. Who are the leaders of this democratic socialism today? The most powerful uh, proponents of socialism, ironically, are not in a formal political party. We think of this as a straight uh, fight between the right and the left or between the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, but the Democrats have three groups of allies, and I mentioned them earlier in the program. They have academia, which is the whole university and art sector. Then you have Hollywood, which mm -hmm. is not just the movies, but it's also Broadway and it's the music industry, mm -hmm. the whole entertainment complex. Uh, and then you have the media. Uh, and the media has been essentially a political, almost propaganda arm of the democratic left, pushing socialism through uh, not only the newspapers and the channels and networks, but also through digital platforms and trying to block and censor people uh, who take a different point of view. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, let me take you to uh, one of our listeners right now that's called in and has a question for you. Okay, let's go to Ralph in California. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Ralph. How are you? I'm fine, and I hope everybody is well. Uh, okay. I have a comment and uh, then a question. My comment is that I have a family member, I won't mention his name, that worked for two presidents, one of the chief of staff, and he was also in the highest position in the CIA. <laughs> he is a Democrat, a middle of the rotor. Here is what I have learned from him recently through, through uh, another family member. This thing that's going on in this country with socialism and all this radicalism and so forth has actually gotten away from the Democrats. The Democrats themselves today are scared to death. This has gotten away from them. This thing that they thought they were going to use this movement to get more votes and to get people to hate Trump has gotten out of control, and they're even afraid. They uh, are scared to death that they're losing uh, their handle, their grip on these people. And my question to you, Dinesh, is where do you think this all ends? Well, I think that uh, we are unfortunately in a little bit of a, of a cold civil war in the country. And, and I say a cold civil war because it's not an open hostilities for the most part. But you really have a very deep um, political, but also a moral and a cultural divide. In the past, Republicans and Democrats agreed on goals, but disagreed on means. Uh, and, and it's possible to have a reasonable disagreement if you have a shared goal. We're trying to go, let's say, to Chicago, and now we're debating whether to take the bus or whether to take the train. That's a debate about means. But if one group of people wants to go to Chicago, another group of people wants to go, let's say, to Boston, then you're going in completely different directions. Uh, and so it, what you create is a tug of war and sometimes a very nasty tug of war in which one guy only wins if the other guy loses. Um, and so uh, I think this is ultimately a almost a sort of uh, existential fight, if you will, uh, in which Republicans believe that if Trump loses, uh, we lose America, or at least we lose the America that I came to this country to be part of. Right. We lose uh, that America. Right. Uh, and the left believes, conversely, that if Trump wins, they lose their America. So to them, America was originally a very bad place, um, but created by the founders, a system of oppression. And they have been, the left has been liberating America by moving it away from the founding principles, and that's what they mean by the word pro. They, that's what they mean by the word progress. They're progressives, right. mm -hmm. and progressive means moving away from the American founding. Right. I, I, I have a question, real okay. quick, if you don't mind me interrupting, uh, Dinesh. I, I, being a 40-year-old uh, father of four girls, looking at the way that this country is heading, my question to you is: Why do you think that there's so many? Republicans who are quote unquote never Trumpers, why do you think that they cannot get behind this president and what he is doing for not only our nation, the economy, uh, for the church itself? He is the most uh, pro pro life president we've ever seen You're right. uh, in, in, in this pro in Israel, pro Israel, pro church. Uh, why do you think that these never Trumpers can ever get behind him? I think that there are really two reasons for it, um, one a superficial one and one kind of a deeper one. Uh, the superficial one is that when Trump first came on the scene, uh, there was actually reasonable skepticism about Trump. Nobody knew where he was coming from. Nobody really knew fully what he believed. A lot of these never Trumpers dug in against him. They attacked him. Mm -hmm. And Trump, being Trump, attacked them back mm -hmm. uh, and attract, attacked them in his Trumpian way. He called them things like dumb as a rock and so <laughs> on. Um, and this it hurt their feelings, it insulted them. And these are extremely pompous and self-important people. Uh, and they don't forget these injuries uh, very easily. So they've been smarting about these Trumpian attacks now for four years. That's the superficial reason. The deeper reason is I think that there are Republicans who are still nostalgically living in the Reagan era, an era of a kind of kinder, gentler America. Mm -hmm. And they sort of believe that we're the party of the nice guys. So even if the other guys are mean and gangsterized, 
or we have to respond ultimately with forbearance and civility. Um, they don't realize, I think as Lincoln did, uh, going back now to the uh, 1860s, that it's possible that the environment in your country changes and that even if you are a moderate man, you are now a moderate man in an immoderate environment. Uh, and you've got to be recognized that the times have changed and a different kind of leadership is called for. So I see Trump as kind of a man of his time, somebody who recognizes that the left has become more gangsterized. I mean, look at the way that they've been mm -hmm. using the police agencies yes. of the government, right. the FBI, the CIA, the DOJ, the IRS even, against political opponents. Look at these paramilitary gangs on the street. So, so to stand around and pretend like this is the same America, let's just say of the 1980s, I think is the deepest form of delusion. Right. Okay, please describe, the, this is an email, please describe the cancel culture and mob mentality that's associated with this new Democrat socialism. So the main thrust of this uh, cancel culture, if you will, this sort of drive for censorship, which is occurring across our whole society. And by that, I mean, it, it, it's at one time, it seemed to be confined to the campus. But now you'll find that corporations, uh, you're under risk of getting fired if you disagree with their diversity program, or you're run out of Hollywood, or you're fired from your job in the media, or you're banned on Facebook or Twitter, or you're, they cancel your YouTube account. So all of this stuff, which George Orwell uh, warned us about in his, in his dystopian novel, 1984, all of this is kind of coming to, uh, into a grim reality. It's all in the name of fighting hate. And ironically, Orwell predicted that too, that the, ca the hateful campaign to suppress speech would be conducted in the name of fighting hate. Uh, in Orwell's novel, they have something called Hate Week, in which they all get together, the socialists do, uh, and they hatefully denounce hate, and they <laughs> identify so-called haters, and they go after them hatefully. So what we have here is the ultimate of shameless hypocrisy, uh, an attempt ultimately to establish a uniformity of thought and belief in the society. Uh, nothing could be more in inimical to the First Amendment, to the idea of free speech, I think this is something that we all have to be vigilant and fight against uh, because it is a very evil development that has occurred really in the last uh, several years. Yes. Okay. Uh, it says, um, could you please explain how this new democratic socialism will treat the elderly, the disabled, and the handicapped? Ultimately, I think uh, when we think about socialism, we shouldn't just think about economic redistribution. We've got to remember that there are socialists in America who care more about abortion than they do about the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. They care more about transgender bathrooms than they care about universal basic income. Uh, and so uh, when you think of the elderly, there are a lot of people on the left for example, who do not share the root Christian idea that every human life has value. They frequently will speak, sometimes in slightly understated tones, about essentially disposable or useless people. Uh, their campaign against abortion, uh, I mean for abortion, is based upon the idea that there are unwanted and therefore from their point of view socially useless uh, beings who are coming into the world and it should be perfectly okay to stop them from getting there. Uh, it's only a short step from there to say there are useless beings who are in the world, who are outliving their usefulness, uh, and there's absolutely no reason to extend expensive healthcare treatments to people who ultimately have basically lived their whole life. So I can see both at the beginning of life and at the end ending of life kind of a movement ultimately that combines abortion, infanticide, euthanasia. This is the direction the left has been pushing um, toward for a hundred years. Uh, and it's really ultimately only the Christian idea of universal human dignity that stands in their way. Yeah. All right, let's go to another caller. And uh, this is on in California. Yes, Hello. yes welcome uh, to the program today. You have a, a question for our special guest? Um, yes, I do. Okay. Um, my question is, um, why does he 
why do people believe that um, capitalism is a good thing when there is many flaws within the, that system? I mean, problems within that system. The question is about why capitalism is um, just or humane when there are uh, many flaws in the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the kind of a good way, I think, to think about it is to, whenever we're thinking about uh, something fundamental, to simplify and look at something very basic. So let me do it this way. Imagine a society in which you have, let's say, 100 people. Uh, that's it. And let's say it's a socialist utopia. Everybody has the same amount of money. Let's just say ten dollars. Uh, so there's complete equality. Now, one guy, let's say me, Dinesh, decides to write a book, The United States of Socialism. And I say, I've got a book here and I'm putting it on the market. I'm putting it on Amazon uh, and you can buy my book for two dollars. Uh, and so some of those hundred people, let's say 20 of them say, hey, wow, I think I'd like to get Dinesh's book. And so they pay $2. And so now suddenly we have inequality in our society. Why? Because 20 people have paid $2. So I now have $40 uh, plus my original amount. Uh, and everybody else who had $10 and bought the book now only has $8 because they paid $2 for the book. So we suddenly have an inequality. But my question is this. Where is the social injustice? Who has been ripped off? Who has been cheated? Who has been exploited? Who has been robbed? And the answer is absolutely nobody. We started out with an equal sum of money. Somebody offered a product in the market. People voluntarily chose to buy it. They wouldn't have done it if they didn't think the book was worth $2. So here in a very sort of simplified miniature way, we can see how free markets by operating through voluntary consent produce social justice because they get people commodities and things and ideas that they want to buy uh, and they do it at a fair rate of exchange that people agree to. It's a, it is the fact of consent that establishes the justice of the transaction. Right. Look, we got to go to a quick break and we'll be right back after the break with our special guest today, Dinesh. Um, who Susan. is a bestseller, author, and filmmaker. And I know most of you know this man, but he does a tremendous work uh, for here in America to fighting for our freedom every day. I encourage you to go to his movies. I encourage you uh, to buy his books. I think they're extremely important. And we'll be right back after the break. The Francis and Friends program is made possible by your financial support. Thank you, and God bless. All right, we're back with our very special guest, Dinesh D'Souza, and Dorinda from Tennessee is our next caller up. Hello, Dorinda. Do you Hi. have a question for Dinesh? I actually have a comment um, regarding a comment that was made about how college professors are so persuasive um, to the student. Mm -hmm. And I am an older college student and have witnessed this firsthand. And it is very um, disturbing to see this go on because the attitude out of these kids is just mind blowing. Well, do you speak up since you're an older student and say, hey, wait a minute, that's not the way it is? Actually, no, I haven't. I haven't. And, you know, it bothers me that I, that I haven't. Um, I've had one professor that she was so liberal, um, it actually scared me. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say that, but it actually scared me. Well, Dinesh, what would you tell her to do? Well, first of all, I understand her reluctance. You have to remember that the college professor is a sort of mini dictator yeah. uh, in the mm -hmm. classroom. Yes. Right. They control the environment. And not only that, not only do they have the microphone, so to speak, but they also control your grades. Mm. Right. So you're at their mercy. Uh, and the other factor is that when you're dealing, by and large, with young people, they don't know a lot. So if the college professor says something like, Columbus was a genocidal maniac, you know, he murdered millions of people, 
the young person is not smart enough to say, wait a minute, that's actually not true. Um, the white man brought to the American continent diseases to which the American Indians had no immunities. But you can't say this is genocide because genocide involves the intention mm -hmm. to exterminate a population. Now, if young people had the sort of reading that I have over 30 years, they would be able to confound these professors in a minute. But they don't. So they go, oh, wow, I never heard that. I just celebrate Columbus Day. But now you're telling me that Columbus was like Hitler. So, you know, I've really got to stop thinking well about this man. So this is the kind of child abuse, I would say, right. that goes on in our schools and our universities. And it's done by people who actually should know better, but are using their podium uh, as a right. propaganda weapon uh, right. in order to promote their own ideology. Uh, right. I have que a question that I would like to ask. This is coming from uh, Josh, Josh Rosenstern, one of our uh, one of my friends here, yeah. fellow minister. He's asking this question to you, Dinesh. Why is there such a push by the left to demonize the police force, and what do they want to put in its place? What they really want to put in its place is a politically correct police force that will be a weapon of the agenda of the left. So what would such a police force look like? By and large, uh, it would be a police force that would spend most of its time uh, going after law-abiding citizens, for example, who own guns, kind of like the St. Louis couple uh, mm -hmm. that came out brandishing a weapon when a large group of, you know, intimidating uh, protesters and rioters came into their neighborhood and onto their property. They want the police to go after that kind of a homeowning family. Meanwhile, they want the police to look the other way while rioters in Portland and Seattle and New York City smash glass, walk away with handbags, deface uh, small shops. So they want to be able to get away with it while using the police as a weapon against us. And it would be very det detrimental to our country, very detrimental if something like this could happen. And. Um, uh, we have one more caller, Rhonda in Washington. Rhonda, welcome to Sun Life Broadcasting. And you have a quick question for our guest today. I do. Good morning, panel. Good morning. Yes. Hi, Donnie, you and I have something in common. Okay. We have the same birthday. <laughs> okay. Well, that's fantastic. I'm a little bit older than you, but I'll be 70 years old on October 18th. Well, you got me by five years. Mm -hmm. I do. I do. Yeah. Um, so my question is this. Um, I grew up in an era where we were taught to fear communism. We had bomb drills at school. And so, so many of these Democrat leaders are my age, some even older. They've seen communism fail. They've seen it never works. Why are they in love with this push for socialism, which obviously is communism? The simple answer is, is this. If, if someone were to tell you, are dictators and tyrants in the world a bad idea? You and I would go, absolutely. It's horrible to live under a dictatorship or a tyranny. This is the worst form of government ever. Now, let's say someone were to change the question and say, what if this dictatorship or tyranny was run by you? You become the dictator of the world. You get to say what goes and what doesn't go. What do you think of that system of government? Many people would then change their minds immediately and go, oh, that's the, that would be the most fantastic system of government ever because obviously I would be the, the most wonderful monarch or tyrant ever mm -hmm. devised. And so all the fear that you previously had about somebody else telling you what to do now goes away when you're the person who gets to tell everybody else what to do. So right here we see why these democratic leftists who are scared of the idea of tyranny and wouldn't want any tyranny imposed on them are perfectly happy to be tyrants themselves. Wow. Okay, let's go to John in North Carolina. You have a quick question, John. Yes, I do. I'd like to know how uh, people that come from the Middle East or any country that come to the United States and look for freedom and don't appreciate what we have in this country because they look to socialism for their answers. How can someone do that and be in a, in a political system or, and be Congress women and not appreciate what they have and want to change it to something that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be beneficial to them? 
So I think here you um, need to think about two different types of immigrant. Their immigrants are sort of not in the same camp. And in fact, immigrants haven't come to America for the same reason. Uh, let's look at a contrast between me uh, and I think the congressman you're referring to, Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, uh, who is um, a leftist and an Islamicist uh, and also a socialist. So um, the first thing to notice is that Ilhan Omar did not come to this country looking for freedom. Uh, I came to this country voluntarily as an immigrant. I, in a sense, chose America. Um, and most immigrants like me undergo considerable hardship to get here. Why? Because we're drawn to something about America, something about the American dream that we want. Now, Ilhan Omar came to America as a refugee, which is a completely different thing. She didn't choose America. There were very bad things going on in her country, and this country let her in. She didn't necessarily come to America even looking for freedom. Mm -hmm. She came to America essentially to escape what was going on someplace else, but at no point did Ilhan Omar, I think, uh, ever uh, feel real gratitude to America, fall in love with the American dream, uh, come to respect the American founding or the American founders. She's basically a displaced Islamic radical inside of America who would like to see America itself move in the direction of radical Islam. That's what she's been fighting for. That explains all her, all her statements and her actions. So that's the kind of immigrant, in my opinion, that we don't need in America. Mm -hmm. All right, let, let me ask this question. Um, it said, uh, I'll read the statement first, uh, Dinesh, and uh, it says that this man, speaking of yourself, uh, is exactly what the left is afraid of. Uh, brave, true, and firmly correct. I thought you'd be interested in what the listeners think of you out there today. That's quite a compliment. But the question is, uh, how, what can the left do? And this is a question that we get here all the time uh, about what can we do? Can we organize? Can we get together? Can we fight back against this evil that's trying to take over our country? And of course, today, this program is exactly what we're doing. Uh, we're fighting back. We're pushing back. I firmly believe that getting the truth out to men and women in the United States of America is the greatest thing that we can do at this point in time. But I would like your opinion on that. Yeah, I'd like to, um, I'd like to urge um, people who like what I have to say on this program to follow me on social media. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some of us who think, oh, wow, social media, uh, how, how important is that? I only have 30 friends on Facebook. Yeah, but see, they have 30 friends on right. Facebook. That's right. So yeah. social media these days is a very good way to take a lone individual who's sitting in your office or your home uh, and turn you into an influencer, a, a publisher to disseminate ideas. So when people say, what can I do? How can I get the message out? The truth of it is uh, social media is a very good weapon to do that. Um, you should be inform yourself and then use social media, all the various platforms of social media uh, from Twitter to Instagram to Facebook uh, to share the ideas that you like with your friends and everybody you know. Mo most of us use a very small portion of the influence that we actually have. Uh, and so using your influence as much as you can is what you can do. I, I, I think that's a great idea, and I want to encourage all of our followers to do that. If you have Instagram, Facebook, you need to follow Dinesh D'Souza. I do, and I like a lot of his posts. And uh, I think, Dinesh, you should follow me right back. I would appreciate that. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I do have one question, and it's about global warming. Yeah. Um, it's becoming a crusade for the left. So what is its end result? What are they trying to accomplish with global warming? They're trying to accomplish uh, with global warming what they were not able to accomplish uh, through, you could call it, classic socialism. So when Marx talked about socialism, uh, Marx anticipated and, in fact, prophesied that there would be a revolt of the working class that would overthrow the capitalist class and create a socialist takeover. Mm -hmm. 
But that has never happened anywhere in the world. Nowhere from Marxist time all the way to today has it ever occurred that a working class has done this. And so the left has figured this out. We're not going to get the revolution they know that way. And so they have to get it some other way. Well, how? <coughs> Turns out that climate change is kind of a clever ruse because it appeals to the politics of fear. Now, the strange thing about climate change is that from in most of our experience, the climate today is exactly the same as it was when we were five years old. Mm -hmm. There's really no difference. And so nobody experiences in any real sense meaningful changes in the climate. But what the left will do is produce a battery of experts, usually paid people on their own side, mm -hmm. to go, oh, yes, 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 we've put our temperate, I put, we've put the thermometer in the ocean, uh, and there is a one degree shift in global average temperatures over the last century. I mean, this is uh, hard to believe I'm, I'm stating this as a serious argument, but <laughs> right. this is what they say. And so they go, what we have to do right now is these 11 socialist things many of which, by the way, have nothing to do with climate change. Free health care, free contraception and abortion services, basic minimum wage, and so on, things that are unrelated to fixing the climate. Why? Because nobody really knows how to fix the climate. If you told right. somebody, figure out a way to make the globe one degree cooler than it is, nobody would even know where to start. Um, so all of this is, a, to me, a kind of an intellectual racket, but it's a very sophisticated racket, and it's a worldwide racket. Now, no one really believes it. Even the people who talk about climate change don't believe it. So Obama, for example, has been talking about, you know, the oceans are rising. They're going to be swamping all the coastal cities. Meanwhile, last year, the Obamas buy a multi-million dollar property on the ocean sure, in Martha's right. Vineyard. So if they thought that the oceans were going to rise and swamp their property, they would never do it. They know it's bogus. They know it's hokum. But they know it's politically useful hokum, which is why they continue to say it. Yeah, we're talking here today, and we know that that President Donald Trump is fighting this battle every sing, single day of his life. Um, and, you know, I'd like to ask the question uh, concerning this present president of the United States uh, that's hated by the left. And it seems like a lot of people in America, and he's facing re-election. And what... I mean, what do you see out there? For um, we got so many people saying, "Oh, you know, we're going to get him out of office." We got others saying, "No, you know, he's going to remain in office." And you know, I have concerns about what is happening in my country today. So, um, I'd like your opinion of this present president of the United States of America. He's uh, a very um, unusual character, and uh, in some ways he reminds me of some characters in the Bible, because um, the way I think about it is, if you read the Bible, you're always struck by the oddity of God choosing that guy. Right. Well, like, why that guy? He's such an odd fellow. You'd never, if you had to kind of do a survey, you would never pick that guy or even someone like that, but, but God did. Uh, and I think uh, with Trump, uh, he happens to be sort of the providential leader for this moment um, in time. Uh, and he's uniquely suited to it in a way that most other Republicans would not be. Most other Republicans in this kind of combative environment would uh, go invertebrate. They would hide under the table. They would not know how to deal with the media. I think Trump is chronically and intrinsically uh, a fighter. Um, if you... Uh, attack him, he will attack you back. That's just his natural instinct. And in, mm -hmm. in a way, he cannot not do it. Uh, that's who he is. Uh, but I think Republicans need a fighter at this moment. Uh, and for this reason, I think he's doing a good job. Now, his reelection is no longer certain. Uh, he had a powerful, positive economy behind him. Uh, he doesn't anymore due to coronavirus. It's not his fault, but he, it nevertheless hurts him anyway. Uh, and so I think it's going to be a hard fight in November. We need kind of all hands at the wheel. Uh, but there's a lot at stake uh, and much is riding on Trump's reelection. And uh, with that being said, I do have one question. What do you say to the Christians out there that refuse to vote for him and uh, they refuse to vote uh, for Donald Trump because of whatever reason? I, I would say that um, this is ultimately, I think, 
uh, the result of a certain kind of false pride. And the false pride is, I'm a better man than Donald Trump. Mm. I am a person of virtue, and Trump is a lesser man. And therefore, in order to demonstrate my moral superiority to Trump, uh, I'm going to vote against him, because character matters. Now, here's the problem. Uh, we live in a world of binary choices. In America, we have two parties. One party is aggressively promoting an agenda that is not only pro-socialist, but anti-Christian in every right. meaningful sense of the term. Right. Uh, they are undermining Christian values, and they do it openly. Uh, and so um, we have to choose between these two camps. Um, and Christians have long understood that given choices, and if you have a bad choice and a worse choice, it makes moral sense uh, to pick the choice that is going to be the lesser evil. So even I would say if you have some reservations about Trump, um, you don't want to go from the frying pan into the fire. You don't want to be like Jimmy Carter who said, oh, you know, there's a Shah of Iran and he has a secret police and he's a dictator. Let me pull the Persian rug out from under him. And what do we get? Khomeini. Yes. So in yeah. trying to get rid of the bad guy, uh, the guy who's perceived to be a bad guy, you end up with a worse guy and you destroy the lives not just of Iranians, but people are, you, you create threats around the world for 50 years after you, what you did. So you did it out of good intentions, but your good intentions had very bad results. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next question that I have is uh, concerning the radical minority. They're saying minority. Um, and it says they are composed mostly um, of Democrats. Do you agree with that? I agree that the camp of radical socialists is in fact a minority, but I do think that this radical minority has a lot of influence and to some degree even uh, control through intimidation uh, over a much larger section of society. So, for example, you might have a very small group of people who think, for example, that every corporation is racist. But every corporation lives in fear of being accused of racism. Right. And so a small number of people can go and put up signs outside a corporation and say, never buy from this corporation because these people are racist. And the corporation will do backward somersaults and pay all kinds of fees and give all kinds of giveaways and bribes to avoid the stigma of this accusation, even though they know that the accusation is A, false, and made by a small minority, they allow this bullying minority to control their behavior. It's, it's gotten to the point, and I've made this statement many times, we've come to a point that it's worse to be called a racist than it is a pedophile. That's, that's how warped everything has got. Everybody, if you don't toe the line, then their pet thing is you're a racist. Mm -hmm. And most people don't want to be called names. And so they'll either, they'll, they just go along to get along or they just hide off in their corner. But what I'm trying to tell people is it doesn't matter what they call you. It's what you know you are and who God knows you are. And so stand up for what's right and vote correctly. Well, not only this, but the usually the charge of racism carries a sting. Yeah. Not because of anything that you or I did, uh, but because of history. So a series of, of, of gross historical crimes, going back to slavery and the slave plantation, continuing with segregation and Jim Crow and racial terrorism and lynching and the Ku Klux Klan. So the first question I have raised in my work is, well, who did those things? And the answer is, these things were done with the full support and backing of the Democratic Party. Right. This is a fact. And so what makes this particularly strange and ironic is that the very Democrats whose party did all these things now pretend like they didn't do them. They're always saying, oh, no, they were done by America. They were done by the South. They were done by the white men. No, there were, there were white men on both sides of this debate. There were white men who had slaves, and there were white men who fought against slavery. There were white men who imposed segregation laws, and there were white men who fought against them. So which group of white men did your party belong to? The answer is, you're the bad guys. You did all this stuff. You've never apologized for it. You've never paid one penny of restitution. But here you are, the very people who have essentially been arsonists, now showing up ultimately as the firefighter and saying, hey, I'm the solution to the problem. No, you're not the solution. You actually are the problem. 
Yep. All Perfect. right, let me ask another question from one our listeners. Do you think that we're being indoctrinated into more government control over our lives with COVID-19 and the coming vaccine? And how do we defend ourselves if we don't want to take this vaccine? Thank you. And there's some consternation and, uh, and concern concerning if they do develop, which they're very close to developing a vaccine for COVID-19, um, that it's going to be dangerous if you take that vaccination, but you're going to be forced by the government to take that vaccination. Do you have any concern about that? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, I don't, I don't belong to the school that says that the coronavirus is by itself a hoax. There's mm -hmm. obviously a real virus, right. and, there and it obviously has been a, a global problem. Right. Now, we also know at the same time, though, that the medical establishment has, to some degree, been manipulated. It's been uh, padding the estimates of the cases. It's been padding the deaths. I mean, there was recently an almost comical example of a fellow who was killed in a motorcycle accident. Uh, they tested him. He was positive for coronavirus. So right. he was added to the coronavirus right. death count, even though he was clearly not killed by coronavirus, mm -hmm. but killed by a truck right. Uh, right. on the highway. So talk about a distortion, manipulation. So this is kind of what goes on with the climate change industry, too. It's ultimately distorted. It's made up. It's padded. It's propagandistic. Uh, so there's an element of all that. Um, the other thing to make to uh, emphasize is that our civil liberties um, are not suspended because there is a virus. So sometimes people think there's a virus, so I no longer enjoy the right to free speech. Not true. There's a virus, so I no longer have the right to go to church. Not true. There's a virus, so I no longer have the right to assemble. Not true. Nobody gave up our constitutional liberties because there's a virus. And what that means is that we should act responsibly. When I go out in public, I do wear a mask, uh, but I do it voluntarily because I want to protect myself and I want to protect others. So mm -hmm. there's a great distinction to be made. It's almost like in Islamic societies, whether you wear the head covering or the headscarf. It's one thing for people who want to wear a hijab or a headscarf in Iran or Afghanistan. It's a completely different thing when the government says you must. Yes. And listen, we want to thank you for being with us. Our time is running out. And hasn't this been a great interview Absolutely. today? And we yeah. thank you so much for coming can, in and being on the program. Donnie, quickly. Can we, uh, let's say a word of prayer for okay. Dinesh. And because uh, he's doing a great job yes, for America. Yes, yes. Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you for our guest today. We thank you for the stand that he has taken for democracy and for freedom. And we know it's come at a great price. Lord, I'm asking that there be a hedge round about yes, him yes. and his family, that you would watch over him, that you would protect him, and you would bless him. Because, Lord, we need his voice in this nation in these last days. And pour out your blessing upon him. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. amen. And Denise, do you, Dinesh, do you have a last word? Well, I think that uh, as Christians, we're called to be salt and light in the world. We need to take that responsibility as seriously. We're not going to be here forever. Uh, but we are in some degree the arms and legs of God in the world. And I think God wants and expects of us that we use the talents that he gave us constructively yes. uh, to the benefit of his glory and the promotion of his kingdom. And that's our Christian responsibility. And yes, we should it keep is. It. Yeah. Thank you for being with us. Uh, and Thank we you. trust the next time that he gets to uh, uh, be on the program, he can be here in the studio live with us. Well, possibly it'll work out that way. Love you. God bless you. We'll be back with you tomorrow. Email questions and comments about today's program to onair at jsm.org. Be sure to join Francis Swaggart on Facebook at facebook.com slash Francis Swaggart. Archived programs are available at sunlifetv.com. Francis and Friends is a production of the Sun Life Broadcasting Network.